still go reading. The year was 1891. Nair typing. Also, character in a movie is writing a literal book about the events of the movie cliche. Straight up theft. Three men have been following you for the last half mile. Their motives highly unsavory. They're not pursuing me, they're escorting me and- They seem to be doing a terrible job since they allowed Sherlock to take your package and talk to you alone this whole time. Also, Sherlock Holmes, best detective in the world, knew he needed to be in the marketplace dressed in a costume to uncover a dastardly plot today, but couldn't figure out that the men following Irene were actually with her. 19th century beatdown music. I forgot the rest. You know, Albert Downey Jr.'s Sherlock Holmes is basically Johnny Depp's Jack Sparrow without the... without the... Yeah, I don't know, they're basically the same character. I can't believe I never noticed that before now. Yep, Sherlock Holmes is still Larry Holmes. Look, you want to show the power of Holmes' mind by allowing him to be slightly more predictive in a fistfight than his opponent. Fine. I think it's stupid, but fine. But you can't show him literally predicting this asshole will pull a gun on him, especially since he works for Rachel McAdams and she clearly didn't want Holmes killed. There's a difference between predictive cognition during fighting and flat out Nostradamus shit. The director said, let's have him catch an apple that stayed in the air in an impossibly long time during the fight so he'll look like even more of a Madonna. I mean asshole. I said asshole. Look, I know he's the best detective ever and all, but how did he know Irene would be delivering this package to this dude at an auction house? And how did he get here in time after fighting those four bodyguards? One million pounds. Sherlock set this pipe up to set a fire in the auction house, but is this how pipes work? You just set it next to a flammable object and whatever it's near goes up in flames with perfect timing? Ramsey's ex machina. So did anyone put out that fire? Or was the fire's existence directly proportional to our concern with it once Sherlock Holmes started dealing with the bomb? Wait, are all these people hypnotized? Are they all in the sunken place? Because they sure as hell knew to get out once that teacup was struck. Ah, it's that guy from Mad Men. And why does the movie spend so much of the first nine minutes building up this mastermind criminal no one has ever seen just to blow their reveal wand at the nine minute 40 second mark? I like how he's so smart and omnipotent as to be in disguise pretending to be asleep on the street earlier when Adler walks by with a dangerous package, but then stupid enough not to think she might be in danger after he stopped the package bomb from going off and just going to the restaurant like a stupid puppy dog. They said eight o'clock. He waited an hour and 10 minutes before getting concerned? Wait, he's not even concerned? Man, f*** this guy. I'm going to overlook the sudden greenhouse inside Holmes' home and go straight for this turkey, a species native to North America, which means somehow in the early 1890s, Sherlock Holmes, he of the social anxiety and reclusiveness, has either traveled to America to purchase or steal a turkey, or has been sent one as a gift by an American, possibly Edison. And both of these explanations fail to excuse this turkey. The turkey is being sent. Deal with it. He's been on a diet of coffee, tobacco, and coca leaves. Throw in a little cocaine and you got the Mickey Rourke meal plan. While I applaud the film's attempt to show us Holmes' obsession with this case, there are definitely more red lines on this board than there are things a red line might connect another thing to. Follow that strand. That strand? That one strand? The f This newspaper clipping about an Indian cotton tycoon has a column on the left and a column on the right that are the exact same paragraphs. It's a game, dear man, a shadowy game. That's good enough for me. Roll credits. So do you mind terribly if I try my adrenal extract? Experimenting on animals? I expect the clit to come down on you hard. Why are you looking at me with such concern? I'm so very worried. Your vitality is being drained from you. Movie has time for this. Worst thing about Switzerland is the altitude. Nope, the worst thing about Switzerland is definitely their over-reliance on novelty multi-purpose knives. Girls swinging upside down in 90s on a circus swing over what appears to be a shuffleboard table, and honestly, I'm curious how the screenwriter was able to access my very specific teenage dreams. You completely forgot about my stag party, didn't you? Even though Watson knows Holmes better than anybody, he actually thought for even the briefest moment that Holmes planned out a stag party. This despite seeing his Moriarty wall, which pretty much should have told him right then and there that Holmes didn't plan a party, well, that he's a selfish asshole. There's a man concealed in the rafters above us, so it's safe to presume that your next client is here to kill you. The real question is, why didn't he already? He had the chance to kill her before Sherlock even walked in. Maybe the reason he's been stuck up there is so we can yet again be delivered proof how amazing Sherlock is at Holmesy. First, pillage the nest. Jesus, I am so over Sherlock's Holmes Mega 13 abilities. Sherlock, who once again predicted everything this assassin was going to do, somehow didn't predict this. What a dumbass. While this is an impressive set of acrobatics, I'm wondering how the f*** he knew where Holmes would be at this very moment. Unnecessary matrixing. Also, this guy does a backflip against the wall and his back is still turned away from Holmes after flipping. So what was the f***ing point of that? You don't get style points in a fight. He lives because he landed on that grain pillow. Looks like we've got ourselves our next cockfight. In 1891 London, if you found yourself fighting in the street at night, there was always the constant danger of a gang of gamblers kidnapping you and forcing you to box for their pleasure. Just a constant threat. An epidemic, really. Killed more people than the play. Movie seems to be ringing laughs from how clueless Watson is to Holmes' current predicament. Like, he should be helping. But Holmes specifically didn't tell Watson why they were here. So him laughing shouldn't be funny. It should be what we expect him to be doing. 
No, wait a minute. Is that the rule? If the gambling table is knocked over by a fight, the money already in the pot for the current hand is open to grabs to anyone nearby? This seems like the very definition of bad form. Sherlock has a kick so powerful that it knocks a nimble assassin through some doors and well into the water below. I'm going to make a bet that Sherlock has never successfully kicked a man in the air 30 feet away on the fly before tonight. But I agree, this scene needed to be over, and I'm glad it is. It's the 19th century, so cars aren't going nearly fast enough for this deer to appear suddenly and crash into the carriage like a horror film. But I'd remove a hundred sins if it did. Jesus, Watson's stag party and his wedding were so close together that there was absolutely no way he was going to show up to his wedding sober. No lie, I saw this chalkboard and immediately thought, Rambaldi. Holmes has to be smart enough to guess that any evidence he spots in this office is potentially staged, right? Right? The strain proves too much for her. It's only a matter of time before a chessboard shows up. Damn it! With tragic consequences. This seems to be the actual first moment he has even thought about Adler since his lunch with her. My respect for you, Mr. Holmes, is the only reason you're still alive. <laughs> that and the fact that the assassin you sent during that whole casino parkour f***ery failed. Another time, then. Chess, chess, chess! Well, I am definitely going to write a potential audio outtake here with the Harry Potter music. But I also want to point out how obvious it is this nighttime train scene was shot during the day and artificially nighttimed. Jesus Christ, these assassins sure love their knives, don't they? Ever thought of using the element of surprise, or maybe use a gun sometime? Looks like Sherlock will have a lot of explaining to do once Hercule Poirot starts asking questions about who got murdered on this Orient Express. Throw Mary from the train. Sink knob somehow opens this very important compartment on the train. Got it. So Holmes replaced two shells with lipstick, and this somehow managed to save the day? I mean, with most of Holmes' schemes, you think, yeah, that's kind of far-fetched, but sure. With this, it requires so much luck, you might as well call him Sherlock Holmes. Movie goes full David Fincher here, and look, even David Fincher learned to tone this sh down after a few movies, whereas this is one of Guy Ritchie's later films in his career. I'm not sure why the bad guys even thought they'd need a machine gun when they were sent to kill Watson, but why didn't they just use that in the first place? They had a whole box of grenades, too? I mean, remember how they first tried to kill Watson? It was a dude with a knife. Since then, they've gone all out with shotguns, machine guns, and grenades. This isn't that difficult, you f***s. Paris. The most sensible honeymoon destination of all. Is this train really still going? Is the conductor asleep? Or is this on some sort of autopilot? You know how I know this music is Hans Zimmer? Because I'm pretty sure this music was in Pirates of the Caribbean before. Follow mine, Hart. That's weird. That's exactly what I call my boner. Just so that, I guess, so that Holmes can I told you so Watson again and no other reason, two very smart people will now get Highwayman by Discount Artful Dodger here and his crew. Wine, so a wine cellar located near a printing press. Um, not necessarily, but you're right, so that's ridiculously amazing. I mean, it's not like they couldn't just have a bottle of wine somewhere other than a wine cellar, or the million other ways wine could just happen to be on a paper. I'm beginning to understand how a man with a particular disposition under certain circumstances might grow to enjoy the company of a, of a, a person of, of, of your gender. First off, is this the movie's weird way of telling us Mycroft is gay? Second off, is this the movie's weird way of telling us Mycroft doesn't comprehend life? Infiltrating a huge commercial kitchen is super easy, because everyone is overworked, underpaid, and could give a rat's ass. 1789. A seminal vintage. Bull Sommeliers are amazing, because they can discern wines and vintages by smell and taste at glass level. Holmes is far enough away he might not even smell this dude's farts, given the wind currents at the time. From this, Sherlock figures out that there must be a secret room behind this wall. This is the power of Sherlock's keen sense of observation, and apparently reading the screenplay. Plus, like, there's two ex machinas in one here. So that's what we'll call a duo ex machina. To the opera. This is a battle cry that would only rally Fraser, his brother Niles, probably Max from Rushmore, Patrick Bateman and Date, and Thomas Dickey Ripley Greenlee. Sherlock now realizes that he's been set up. The chess piece proves it. But think of all the things that had to go right for this to go wrong. Sherlock would have had to figure out that Simza's letter was printed in a place with a printing press next to a wine cellar. Would have to go to an anarchist group's headquarters, talk to the leader, have the leader kill himself, then figure out there was a secret room where he worked on a prop for the Don Giovanni opera, all while ignoring the other clues that he is just now remembering. Pretty damn convenient how closely this opera mirrors this cutaway scene of Gun War Aftermath. He was needed a wind gauge. He placed here. And I'll prove that by pointing to this random spot on the ledge that has no evidence at all. Seriously, out of all the things they figure out from this rooftop, that the assassin used a wind gauge and where he placed it provides zero information that is useful. What better way to conceal a killing? No one looks for a bullet hole in a bomb blast. Or stick with me now, you don't even shoot him at all, and you let the bomb do the killing. Am I missing something here? Last night's bombing was clearly meant to look like Germany's retaliation for Strasbourg. Why would the Russians hold a grudge against the Washington Nationals? But taking 10 minutes to get to the Jardin des Tuileries, where the largest concentration of the winged vermin may be found, reduces that to one, the Gardenau.
Holmes assumes that Moriarty would need to find the largest concentration of pigeons in order to indulge his little habit. It makes several stops along the way, one of which is Elbron, where my heart's factory is. Couldn't you figure this out without knowing Moriarty likes to feed the pigeons? You know he just killed Meinhardt, and you know Meinhardt has a weapons factory in Germany. Also, if Sherlock was so amazing with his disguises, why didn't he just follow Moriarty instead of working all his brain power on a problem that seems pretty easy? Unfortunately, due to the bombing, the crossing between France and Germany is to be closed. Apparently, despite this fact, it closes after Moriarty crosses the border, right? That's pretty convenient for him, inconvenient for our heroes. Oh well, the girl with the dragon tattoo has to be good for something. No one will be seated during the true grit portion of the movie. And then Sherlock Lord of the Rings himself to his next destination. Here we go with Sherlock Holmes' telescopic eyesight. He went to an optometrist and they found out his vision is 20 negative 30. Holmes is pretty stupid for a guy that's such a genius. Come at once if convenient. If inconvenient, come all the same. It's amazing how they put the exact words I used to say to my ex-girlfriend in college right into this movie, complete with the picture of the watchtower. I mean, what? <laughs> Charming Lark about a crime solver goes full zero dark 30 for a bit and hopes you don't lose your sense of humor. It was nice of Moriarty to bring along his record player in his Schubert album with him on this trip to Germany. Torture music is so much better when it's classical. Watson's head is in the light, right? And Sebastian just shot his cap when he held it up to the light, right? Why isn't he shooting now? To whom did you send the telegram? I thought Moriarty knew Holmes in such a way that he was nearly as equal. Wouldn't he know that he sent the telegram to Mycroft? There's almost nobody else Sherlock could have sent it to, and this is why he's keeping Sherlock alive. That's not fair. And thus the phrase, all's fair in love and war, was born. Everyone who should be dead from this won't be. Do you know what's missing from almost every filmed adaptation of Sherlock Holmes? Gunplay, machine guns, and shootouts. Only 30 minutes left, and the movie suddenly gets a terrible case of Zack Snyderitis. This band of brothers ripoff isn't cool, and it's not made any cooler by the regular speed, then slow, then fast, then regular editing style either. Marco! Oh no, not Marco! His sin was being too unimportant to this story. Movie wastes an inordinate amount of time trying to make us believe Sherlock Holmes is dead in his own movie with 30 minutes left. This old brother Pulp Fiction shit is unacceptable. Movie that has stolen half of its shit from other movies continues the tradition by stealing this impossible mountainside lodge from Batman Begins. Also, how would such a massive waterfall work at snow-capped mountain level altitudes? Answer, it wouldn't. If we can find him and stop him, we will perhaps not only save his life, but prevent the collapse of Western civilization. Iron Man is just gonna bleed a bit into every role Robert Downey Jr. plays from this point forward, I guess. Those twins weren't twins. My suspicions were aroused in Heilborn when one failed to go to the aid of the other. Wait a minute, there were twins in this movie? I don't recall this movie making a big deal about them, even when they introduced them here. I didn't even know they were supposed to be twins. There are so many white dudes with beards in this movie, all of them look alike. A five minute game? If you think you can manage it. An ambassador is about to get murdered, but Sherlock and Moriarty decide to conduct a dick measuring contest playing chess. By the way, if Sherlock loses this match, does that mean anything? Does Watson have to stop looking for the assassin if Moriarty checkmates Sherlock? An actor so consumed with his performance that the one characteristic he cannot accommodate is spontaneous reaction. <laughs> This doesn't prove shit. If this is what proves who the assassin is, then I'm an assassin, because I never react to dishes being dropped when I'm at a restaurant. Sure, I guess with a war looming, maybe everyone innocent reacts to spilled dishes. Doesn't prove anything. Why couldn't this guy kill the ambassador? It would have been easy enough to frame the people you wanted to frame without going through the trouble of putting a guy through identical twin surgery. This fucking assassin guy lingers just long enough and just right, and Watson spotting him and assuming a whole bunch of shit. That guy could have left discreetly, or by a dozen other exits. Hell, he could have gone into the party instead of leaving. This is just some contrived sh** to create a chase scene. I attended several of your lectures. Sherlock went to Moriarty's lectures, apparently with the idea in mind to draw attention to himself, and to a man obsessed with him. This disguise is so bad it's good, I guess. But the notebook would undoubtedly be encoded, so how then to break the code? That's easy. The key is Tesla. Never mind, it's safe. In London. Well, my colleagues are making good use of it. If the little notebook that Moriarty carried around contained the location of a fortune that the police discovered was a crime, then why couldn't this have been used to keep Moriarty out of the peace conference? Otherwise, it's money they can't trace and can't prove anything with and can't legally seize it. Bishop to Bishop 8. Discover check. And incidentally, mate. I would have removed a hundred sins if that wasn't checkmate, and Moriarty ended up winning the chess match, but Holmes still won the other, more important chess match. Moriarty has always been portrayed as Holmes' intellectual equal, so for this movie, of course, things come down to a fist fight. Yeah, so not a good idea to kill off one of Sherlock's most popular villains. I mean, yeah, they could always have brought him back to life if they wanted to continue the series, but then that would cheapen the sacrifice Sherlock makes here. 
Of course, he's not dead either, so it's already kind of cheap. <laughs> he died at 37. <laughs> Wow, the movie made some brief mention of this breathing device 20 minutes ago. Am I really expected to know what the f*** it is now? That thing was so unimportant, it's kind of amazing even Watson remembers anything about it. Uh, apparently so. You're pretty much owned by Disney to do Iron Man for the rest of your life. So no more homes despite this being a big hit. Good feelings gone. <laughs> Your hedge needs trimming. Wasn't expecting a f***ing rainforest. You could fall in love with an orangutan in that. For you I know I'd even try to turn the tide Because you're mine I walk the line I see you've made good use of my old office. F*** me. C'est ici. Descendez. Cadeau. What? A present. Oh, un cadeau. Oui, oui. Allons-y. What? Let's go. Oh. You shouldn't hang me on a hook. My father hung me on a hook once. Once. Trippy. <laughs> <laughs>